ito yung pag-aaral sa aklat ng uh, Hebrews. Yung aklat ng Hebrews isa sa pinakamagandang aklat na pag-aralan dahil marami tayong matutunan dito. Ano? Kung ito ay uh, may kausap kayo na uh, Mormon, ay ito aklat na ito ay isang aklat na Uh, na tuturo sa atin na mali ang kanilang turo. Dahil ang kanilang uh, high priest, nandun pa sa Old Testament. Sa New Testament, ay iba na yung ating high priest, no? si Jesus Christ. Pag uh, sa Madista, maganda rin na uh, equal ito, no? taklat, na ituro sa kanila. Na wala na sila sa Old Testament kundi na dito na tayo sa Old sa New Testament. Ang aktat ng uh, Hebrews ay para sa siyabu. Uh, dahil ito ay, uh, ay, ay exhortation sa mga, mga kapatid natin sa unang panahon, sa first century Christian, early Christianity, na gusto nang bumalik sa Uh, sa Jewish religion. Kaya una ay bakit tayo nag-aaral dito? No? Why should we study Hebrews? So yung aklat ng Hebrews ay help us to grow in our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as the members of the church Usually, we decide to grow for our relationship with Christ. Uh, we, would have, we will have a greater faith and uh, improve our service uh, with God. So, uh, this is one way of uh, learning more our relationship with God, with Jesus, particularly with the Lord Jesus Christ because the book of Hebrews tell us what he did for us also. Next, the uh, why we study it's the book of Hebrews connect the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, ito at nat na ito ay uh, para sa komentary ng uh, uh, Old Testament. Uh, so, more than any other New Testament book, Hebrews connects the dot between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, uh, dahil napakarami siyang uh, uh, ginamit na Old Testament na to, you know, Uh, 35 quotation from the Greek translations of the Old Testament. Uh, then 34 uh, allusion work to uh, support. So meron siyang uh, ginagamit talaga no, nagaling sa Old Testament. Nasabi ng Apostol Pablo doon sa 2 Colossians uh, chapter 2 16 and 17, therefore do not let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink, or in matters of a feast, new moon, Sabbath day, uh, these are only the shadow of the things to come, but the reality is Christ. So the book of Hebrews actually uh, take up this uh, theme and explain it in a greater detailed form. So the Old Testament is the foreshadow of the New Testament, and Hebrew is the place to go and study and so that we will understood, or we will understand this, uh, what Paul uh, told us, that the Old Testament uh, is the shadow of all the the shadow of the things. 
So Hebrews exalt the person and the work of Jesus Christ, prompting us to draw near. So maraming ginawa ang ating Panginoon para sa atin. Uh, so, uh, the book of Hebrews tell us, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, is that uh, keep our eyes fixed in Jesus, the pioneer and the perfectors of our faith. Uh, so, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 22, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the flesh and living way that he inaugurated for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, therefore let us draw near with a sincere heart in the assurance that faith brings, because we have a heart sprinkled clean from the uh, from an evil conscience, and our bodies was in pure water. So, ito yung ginawa ng Panginoon sa atin. He gave his life, his blood, and uh, that because of that, we have an assurance. Number five, or number four Hebrews, is the accusation of high priestly a ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so, ang Panginoon, sa yung high priest natin ngayon, at we will discuss that in detail now. The uh, high priest of Melchizedek under the number five Hebrews is the expression of high of the one. Okay. Okay. So number five uh, Hebrews exalts the authority of the scriptures. And they're important to us. That's true. No? In the uh, on the uh, in the beginning of the book, the uh, God is telling us that He communicated with us before through the uh, the prophets, but now He is communicating to us through His Son. Uh, number six. Uh, Hebrews not only challenges us to live by faith. So we are always encouraged to live by faith, but the book of Hebrews give, provide us with many practical examples of how this is done. Uh, we will discuss actually that in Hebrews chapter 11, the book of faith, an example. Uh, seven, Hebrews has many words of hope and encouragement, but it also has some sobering words of warning for those who disregard God's word and drew back from intimate fellowship with our Lord. Uh, so <clears throat> the author gave us encouragement a lot, Antonino. But he gave us also, I think, five warnings. Uh, so we will discuss that also as we, we go on. So eight, the Hebrews urged us to press on to maturity and warn us of the dangers of uh, complacency. Uh, so press on. And that is actually the theme of Paul. No? Press on. But uh, here in Hebrews, he give us the warning. If you will not uh, move forward. Nine, uh, Hebrews all has accountable, accountable, not only for our own Christian walk, 
but also for what happened to our struggling or straying brethren. And so, uh, you know, yeah, it's just among the uh, uh, warnings atin. For example, in Hebrews chapter 10, 22 to 25, let us hold, let us uh, not, and let us hold unwarringly to the hope that we confess. For the one who made a promise is trustworthy. And let us talk of how to spur one another on love and good works. Not abandoning our own meeting. No? And some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. Or even so, because you see the day, the day during year. So, lagi natin itong uh, binabasa no, sa pagpanahala no, ng ating uh, do not forsake the assembly you know, sa King James Version. Verse uh, next, the Hebrews summon us to endurance and perseverance, especially as days of greater persecution come upon us. You know, the reason why the uh, our brothers and sisters will return uh, trying to go back to uh, the Jewish religion because of persecution. And the book of Hebrews give us uh, instruction on how to overcome those. Uh, especially on Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, chapter 12 also. Chapter 12 verse 10. For said, Think of him who endure such a position against himself by sinner, so that you may not grow weary in your soul and give up. You have not yet resisted to the point of bloodshed in your struggle against sin. So, to yung sinasabi ng author, sabi niya. Yung Panginoon, sabi niya, eh, he overcome that. No? He endure such things. Even giving his life. And we know that. No? In, in, in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to God that it, if he, uh, the things that is going to, uh, to suffer will be uh, uh, taken away from him no? or suspended. But he said, your will be done. He, number 12, Hebrews instruct us on how we should abide in uh, uh, Christ. We know in John chapter 15, the central text is that we need to abide in Christ. And uh, that is very important to be abiding in. But in the book of Hebrews, we cannot find that word. Abide in Christ. But Hebrews exalt the person of Jesus Christ and his word and exhort us to abide in his word. And that is more important uh, than this. No, we need to abide in his word. As God spoke to us through him. So yun ang mga dahilan kung bakit tayo nag-aaral no? ng aklat ng uh, Hebrews. Paano natin gawin dito? No? So how we'll approach this study? So our goal is to help us all understand the message of Hebrews as a book. So the, the message actually is the superiority of Jesus Christ. The book has several sections. So we will begin at the first section, work through the entire book. And we will begin in section 
with an overview of the entire section, and then we'll work out through the smaller segment of that section. So we will do that now. So the question is, who wrote the book of Hebrews? The authorship. The authors of Hebrews is not indicated in the epistles. And there is considerable debate as to who it might be. It is interesting and perhaps even troubling that so much report has been ex uh, expanded to determine the authors of the book of Hebrews when it appears that God did not want us to know. One author's uh, commentary, uh, let me see that now, Paul Engelworth, in his commentary, he proposed or he mentioned 13, 13 authors to be considered who wrote this book. And he devoted a lot of uh, uh, pages in his commentary just to show or propose 13 authors. But you see, looking at the Word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 29, 29 says, Secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those that are revealed belongs to, to us and our descendants forever. So the, we might obey all the words of this law. No? Lagi natin sinasabi ito pag may nagtanong sa atin. Uh, at hindi natin masagot. Uh, always uh, saying the secret of the Lord's belong to Him. But furthermore, or a step ahead, a step farther, it seems that Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, tell us why the author did not mention his name or conceal his name. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in those, but this in last day, he had spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the ears of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the regents of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he uphold the universe by the word of his power and making purifications for sin. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So it seems that this is the reason why he did not uh, mention his name. He wants us to look at the scripture as having came from God. So the word of the scriptures are God's revelation to us, a revelation to which we do well to follow, to heed. So ito yung dahilan kung bakit uh, uh, sa umpisa pa lang sinabi niya ito, ang yung galing ito sa Diyos. No? Yung Diyos nagsalita noong unang panahon sa pamagitan ng mga propeta o sa mga forefathers no? uh, sa ating mga ama by the prophets. At ngayon, siya ay nagsasalita sa pamagitan ng kanyang anak. So gusto niyang ano, no? hindiin na yung kanyang sinulat ito ay nanggaling sa Diyos. So no wonder the, the authors, the human authors, 
is not emphasizing in Hebrews. Uh, although there are, uh, as I've been the author uh, of the book uh, is not the anonymous. Then he, nagsinulat ito, kilala siya ng mga sinulatan niya. So, the authors wants us to look at the scripture as having came from God. Now, furthermore, the authors, the human, the human authors of this book does not name himself. On the other hand, he is not anonymous. Parang kang sumulat sa isang uh, kwa, no? Yung uh, uh, isang uh, dalaga na, na gusto mo at hindi mo pinilagay ang pangalan mo. No? Or gusto mong isabihin ang uh, mga masamang ginawa ng isang tao no? o lalo na sa gobyan o corruption. No? So, so digagawa ka ng sulat uh, anonymous. Pero hindi ito, no? or speak as though the readers are familiar with this identity identity for example in chapter 13 verse 23 you you should know that our brother timothy has been released with whom i see you if he comes soon and so uh Kasi sinabi niya, alam niyo, nangyari kay Aptos do kay Timothy. So he's uh, telling us uh, that he, the audience, the original audience or readers of the book knows the author. Oh, uh, so this has to lead us to a number of different theories as to the identity of the author. So uh, one of the uh, theories that uh, most uh, accepted as the author of the book of Hebrews is Paul. Most of our commentary accepted that Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews. So many of the teaching found within this epistle has been introduced in the other epistles of Paul. It has been suggested that if this epistle was not written by Paul, then it was at least written by someone who was familiar with Paul's teaching and writing. The claimant of Alexandria tell, tells the tradition that he have heard that the epistle was written by Paul in Hebrews and translated in Greek by Luke. So we know that the old the New Testament are written in Greek. And later on, we uh, uh, we translated it to English and different languages. So, another person that uh, uh, presented as maybe the authors of the book is uh, Barnabas. So, Barnabas is an early companion of Paul, was a Levite. And therefore, would have, uh, would have been well versed in the Jewish rituals. So the book of Hebrews, after a lot of uh, things in the Old Testament, is discussed. And probably Barnabas is uh, wrote this because of being a Levite before. But this is not in itself is sufficient to prove the authorship of this Ephesal. 
So I'm not a Levite or even a Jewish, but uh, we have learned a lot of things about the Jewish ritual. We studied that in, in uh, private or in school about the traditions of the Jews. Apollos. So we know very little about Apollos, except that he was an Alexandrian Jew who was said to be eloquent, eloquent of speech. Of course, we know also Apollos as one of the leaders in, uh, in the Corinthians, who assumed as one of uh, parties in the book of Hebrew, or book of uh, uh, Corinthians, first Corinthians. There is a division in the book of Corinthians and one of them uh, lead is Apollos. He was chosen as leader by the, by the Corinthians. And Paul wrote about that in the first Corinthians. Number four, Luke also, was considered author of the book. By the way, most of our brethren accepted uh, Paul as the book of uh, as the authors of the book. Uh, yeah, even some of the uh, great scholars of uh, considered as author, uh, like for example, uh, if 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 Bruce considered uh, Paul as authors of the book. And even, uh, I'm not remember the name of the other one. Uh, anyway, look, we have already noted as one of the, uh, uh, I didn't read it anyway, so, uh, that uh, Eusebius is mentioning in mentioning the similarity of Greek style was found in Acts and Hebrews. So Luke has a knowledge on Greek and the style of the book of Acts and Hebrews are uh, familiar with. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, Luke is have a style that has the same with the book of Hebrews or when you wrote the book of Acts. But then we know from Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 11 that Luke was, Paul, was with Paul in Rome just prior to Paul's death. It was at this time that Paul instructed Timothy to come to Rome. So bago naman tayo si, si Paul, about 68 AD. So Luke was there. In the book of Hebrews, we see that Timothy is now in prison, but is soon to be released in chapter 13, verse 23. So the author plans to journey with Timothy back to the churches to whom the epistle was written. So in other words, he is a freeman. He is not in prison. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released with whom if he comes soon, I shall see you. In other words, here, so the author is telling them that uh, he will be with Timothy. So Paul was not able to do that because he was in prison at the time. So in the next verse, the author delivered a greeting from the believers of Italy. 
in verse 13, verse 24, the second sentence, those from Italy greet you. So Paul also in Italy, in Rome. So we can conclude that this, that the epistle was written from Italy after Timothy had come to Rome in accordance with Paul's instruction. It was not written by Paul, for he was not released from Caesar, from prison, following his imprisonment. Or probably you can say that uh, he dictated that to, to Luke or to Timothy, although he was in prison. Paul was in prison. So let us see the following scenario. Paul, as he is in prison in Rome, as Luke, as his companion, as Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul writes his last epistle to Timothy. The epistle was known as the Second Timothy. In this epistle, he instructed Timothy to come to Rome. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 9, 13 to 21 and 21. Then Timothy come to Rome to see the aged apostle before he dies. So while Timothy is in Rome, Paul is executed by Roman emperor, and Timothy is in prison. So while Timothy is still in prison and awaiting his release, Luke write this epistle to the Hebrews using note left by his mentor, the Apostle Paul. So although Luke is a Gentile, is a Greek by birth, he has now spent many years with Paul and is familiar with the Old Testament scripture. Although he relies upon his Greek uh, Septuagint, the uh, translation of the Old Testament Hebrews to Greek Testament, to Greek language. That is the Cypriot Bible. Much of this thinking has been influenced by his constant exposure to Paul's theology so that his doctrine can be classified as Pauline. It seems that uh, Luke is the one who writes the book. But it could be that Paul dictated that to, to Luke to write it because Luke was there. But it uh, that is really a matter who is the human author of this epistle? No. In fact, I think that's on he does not name himself. In the introduction is so that you will focus upon the message rather than upon the messenger. Parang sermon lang, mas lagi natin sinasabi. No, it doesn't matter who, who preach, but the important is the message. So not the messenger, but the message. So this is important. We have the tendency to focus upon the spiritual teachers as though they were something special. So this is wrong. This is not the messenger who is important rather than the message which he is bringing. Okay, so the date of writing is about uh, 64 to 68 AD. So the book is uh, is known and cited by Clement of Rome in his writing first Clement it is about 95 AD. In other words, when he wrote his book, 
he already knows that uh, uh, who knows that the book of Hebrews is already in circulation. So, So number two, the Hebrews bear no mention of the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem by Titus in AD 70. In other words, uh, when the book was written, the temple is still there. Uh, actually, the authors use uh, let me see that I could apply my so the author would mention uh, the temple in the present tense. No? He use a lot of uh, it seems that the the temple is still existing at the time of the writings of the book of Hebrews. So uh, he regards the authors uh, of Hebrews seems to regards the uh, sacrificial systems of the Old Testament still be in operation number three. You know? The reason why it is dated before and seven D because the author uh, uses a lot. Uh, in Greek, in present tense, that it seems that the, uh, the sacrificial systems of the Old Testament is still going on in the temple. In other words, the temple is still there. And the uh, comparison between uh, the uh, High priest of, of Jesus Christ to that uh, ironic priesthood who is still practicing, still existing at that time. He used the present tense now. Number four, that's number four. Oh, yeah, still there. Uh, so, uh, chapter five, verse one, four, one to four. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God. So in order to offer both gifts and sacrifice for sin, he can deal gently with ignorance and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of he is obligated to offer sacrifice for sins as for the people, so also for himself, as no one takes the honor to himself, but receive it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. And so, uh, this writing is telling us that uh, the continuing appointing of a high priest is going on at this time. Number four, oh, ito pa, no? uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, when he said, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, uh, but whatever is becoming obsolete and the growing is ready to disappear. No? So, hindi pa lang nag-disappear. No? Nandun pa. Handa nang mag-gana. No? Mawawala. Because the old, the New Testament is coming in. Uh, so, that alluded to that still the uh, system, the Old Testament system of worship still 
practice during the writings of the book of Hebrews. The priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. So that is in present tense, no? That they're still doing it. They practice um, the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice is still going on in the temple as it was not yet destroyed by Titus. He is the emperor who destroyed the uh, the temple in Jerusalem. Number four, Hebrew was written during the lifetime of Timothy, whom the author knew. 13 verse 23, take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom if he comes soon, I shall see you. So we know that Timothy was still alive when Paul was murdered in 68 AD, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. But we do not know the later history about uh, Timothy, that because the second Timothy uh, it was recognized as the last letter that Paul wrote. Now, so for the background and the purpose of the book, we will discuss that later on. But who are the recipients of the epistle? The book does not mention the author as well as the recipient of the epistle. Usually Paul mentioned in his writing the recipient, for example, uh, Corinthians. He mentioned that to the Corinth, to the Romans, to the Ephesians, to the Colossian Christians. But here, he never mentioned but at least five important factors about this audience. So the original audience, uh, they are actually a Jewist. First, there is a reason to think at least a good portions of the original audience was Jewish, as mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophet at many times and in various. So here, the author referred to how God has revealed himself to Israel in the Old Testament. But notice how he called the Old Testament Israelites our forefathers, the ancestors of the authors and his audience. So no wonder that the Tertullian, one of the uh, who live about uh, uh, between uh, 155 to 230 AD, he called this uh, book as uh, Pros Hebrews. He said, for the Hebrews. So the Hebrews actually are, are the Israelites. Yeah, that is their uh, old name in the Old Testament. They are called Hebrews, and later on, 
then they settle to the promised land. They become Israelites. Then we know that they were Hellenistic. A second is likely that the audience was largely part Hellenistic. Hellenistic are those Jews that are living outside of Palestine. So in other words, the church that Paul, or rather the epistle of Hebrews wrote, was not within the Palestine. So the contents of Hebrews indicate that the audience were familiar with uh, theological teaching that were more common among Jews living outside of Pal Palestine than among more tradition, traditional Jewish circle within Palestine. So probably it was written in Italy, in Rome. Or rather the audience. The fact that the first epistles of Clemens of Rome uh, referred to the book as early as AD 95 has led to suggest that the audience was in Rome. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 24 has been used to support this point of view because it mentioned those from Italy. So that is the suggestion that uh, they were Hellenistic because they are not, uh, they are familiar with. Uh, with the teaching of Hellenistic uh, Jews. Number three, the audience are immature. Third, the original audience of Hebrews were immature. Listen to what the authors describe them in chapter five, verse 12. Though by this time you ought to be teacher, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. Uh, so uh, notice that the audience has been uh, a believer long enough for the author to say that you need to be a teacher now. They should have uh, made the uh, uh, Doctrinal progress, but the author, the author noted that needed to be taught again the elementary truth. So they are immature, although they had been members of the church for a long time. But, but, you know, it is very interesting also that the teaching of the book of Hebrews is really advanced. Although they are immature, the author discussed the advanced doctrines. But yet, the author told them that they are immature. Maybe the reason is that they are not uh, listening or following the leaders. And you know, the leaders of the uh, congregation, they practice at the time that they are the one leading the congregation, the teaching. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Yeah. The writers of the Hebrews reminded the authors, the, his origin, for being slow to learn. So it's quite possible that the larger portions of the original audience remained uh, theologically immature because they didn't properly 
respect their leaders. Why do we know that? Because it's suggested in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, where the author told his audience, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep what's over you as a man who must give an account. Obey them so that their works will be joy, not a burden. For that, for that will be of no advantage of you. So uh, we see here that it seems that they are not uh, listening to the leaders. And that is true, no? Uh, the older members of the church uh, sometimes uh, matigas ang ulo, no? Hindi nakikinig sa mga leader, lalo na pag yung leader ay uh, uh, if you are the new minister, it seems that, you know, ang tagal-tagal na namin dito sa church, mas turuan mo pa kami, ano? <laughs> Lalo na pagbata yung preacher, ano? Uh, but it become a reason that they do not progress in the Christian faith. Number four, the audience are persecuted. For the original audience of Hebrews was persecuted. Maybe this is the reason why you are like to abandon Christianity and return to a Jewish religion. There were two well-known times of persecution okay. for Christians during the first century. And that may be in fact the Hebrews original audience at least indirectly. In uh, AD 49, the Roman Emperor Claudius expelled Jews from the city of Rome. And around 64 AD, Emperor Nero persecuted the Christian in the vicinity of Rome. If, if it is true that the audience was actually from Rome, so they are uh, experiencing persecution during this time in AD 49 and AD 64. And they are trying to abandon Christianity. He said in, uh, let me see that, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 to 35, the author drew attention to the suffering, at least in some in the audience, and experience in the past. Remember those early days after you have received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. And so the author telling them, oh, remember what you did before. You still, you uh, experiencing uh, persecution, but you're still there. That's why he said, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. So the experience the persecution, as the author uh, telling us, and he exhorted them that they are able to, to stand on that persecution in the past. And he said, don't throw away that uh, things in the past. Baliwalain, uh, na nakaranas ka na ng persecution at nakatayo ka pa rin. <laughs> so in addition to the uh, persecution in the past, 
and in the present, the authors of the book of Hebrews acknowledge that his audience will facing a, a future persecution. In uh, chapter 12, verse two, 3 and 4, consider Christ who endures such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shielding your blood. So, dito, ang sabi ng author, kung sabi niya, nakaranas ko ng persecution. So, the author expecting a a severe persecution to his audience. And he said, you have not yet the experience of shedding your blood. Uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ as an example. And so they have faced numbers of uh, persecution. The author mentioned that maybe the loss uh, some of their property, some loss, some has been in prison. They have been uh, subjected to public ridicule of some sort. And still he is urging the readers at this point as you write, to be willing to be reproached. He's willing to be uh, uh, face the, uh, the persecution. So look at uh, this is what uh, in Hebrews chapter 12 is telling us. Yet it seems that he is aware that some of them actually stand, still standing on the persecution. But even at the time, uh, they still consider to uh, abandon Christianity because of that. That's why uh, uh, number five, they are near apostasy. Fifth, the audience of the Hebrew faced persecution, at least some of them were near apostasy. That meaning they will abandon Christianity. Rather than simply being discouraged or weakened by suffering, they were in danger of turning away from Christ entirely. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, he gave them warning. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth. No sacrifice for sin is given, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. And so, so we need to be clear that the authors of the book of Hebrews was not concerned about a small sin. This warning is Odin has uh, the, the sin of uh, abandoning Christ is, he said, no sacrifice for sin is left. This is not pity's 
seen, as we could see the atlikod. Uh, sabi niya natin, hindi, ma, hindi lang maliit ang nakasalangan nito. But they are going to turn away from Christ. And the author reminded that if you abandon Christ, there are no more sacrifice for sin is left. So when people reject Christian faith, like some in the original audience of Hebrews were tempted to do, they proved that they never had faith Parang binabaliwala nila yung nangyari sa kanila. They experience struggle. They withstand the persecution yet at the, at the end of the day. They're trying to return to hmm, the Jewish religion. That's why the argument of the book of Hebrews is very strong. And later on, we will uh, uh, we will see that how the authors of the book uh, argue that they should not return to uh, Jewish religion, and this is what uh, the reason why the authors of the book wrote this epistle to. To them. So the purpose as it did to provide words of exhortation or encouragement to his reader to go on in maturity in their faith. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, 26 and 7, as we mentioned, so it is fair to say that the book is uh, is conflict because it is written uh, with many different purposes in mind. There is a positive, and the negative is a warning. And his reader against the dangers of gapsing back into. Uh, going back into Judaism. And then the instructions about the superiority of Christ. In other words, there are a lot of different problems in the, the church and the author emphasized this in his uh, section. So the interpreter actually uh, summarized the over, uh, uh, rather the, the purpose of the book of Hebrews in various ways. But uh, the authors of the Hebrews wrote to exhort his audience to reject the teachings of the Jews and remain faithful to Jesus. And that is what he said here. Oh, here. Yeah. Brother, I urge you to bear my words of exhortation. So, the word I urge you Derived from the Greek word uh, parakaleo, the Berber forms of the Greek noun translated exhortation in the same sentence. The phrase word of exhortation also appear in Acts chapter 13, verse 15, where the men of the synagogue of Pisidia Antioch invited Paul and his companion to give the message of encouragement after reading the, uh, the scripture. In other words, uh, in 
In other words, the uh, the word exhortation actually is the word used uh, 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 designated word as we call it today as sermon. Word of encouragement or a sermon as we call it today. So every epistle or letters in the New Testament contain exhortation to his audience, but the book of Hebrew stands apart other New Testament epistle due to intensity of its exhortation. So sometimes uh, uh, the book of Hebrews was called as the book of sermons because there's a lot of exhortation that are given by the authors of the book. So it is it is like a sermon no? given by a minister or elders of the church encouraging the whole congregation to grow in the knowledge of God. So the intensity of the exhortation can be found in the book of Hebrews. First, the frequency of the exhortations in the book and the styles of the author, rhetorical style associated with this exhortation. So the frequency, the frequencies of the author's exhortation help us understand the urgency of his message. These exhortations are implicit at a time. At least 30 times they appeal to be explicitly. In many occasions, the author used the Greek grammarian called portatory, portatory sanjunctive. Ano ibig sabi nito? No? So the verbal form herbs are employed or often translate lead us. Ayan ang tawag natin sa ano ba? Uh, yung mga grammar din sa Greek. No? Portatory subjunctive. Let us. Let us do this. Let us do that. For example, of this type of exhortation in the chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, in verse 14, let us hold for, firmly to the faith we profess. In verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. So the author um, exhortation, exhorted his audience by using imperatives. So let us, which often translated a direct order. Another example of this type of okay, uh, chapter 12 verses 12 to 16. Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. No? That is an exhortation according to this in the imperative. Make level paths on your feet. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Be holy. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. So let us now see. So one of the reasons it is important to remind 
uh, in, uh, to keep in mind how often the authors directly exhorted his audience in his book. He did not simply want to inform the audience of the doctrines of the church. He informed them doctrinally in order to, pers to persuade them to adopt different attitudes and actions. Instead of thinking or going back to Jewish religion, their attitudes should be changed. And actions should be, instead of going back, it should be forward. So this is what we mean when we call the book or a words of exhortation. So if we don't keep this in mind, we will miss the, uh, the crucial dimensions of the book of Hebrews, the intensity of his exhortation. We will see this in our study, the intents of the author exhortation reflected frequently and uh, gather now the rhetoric, rhetorical style of uh, the book of Hebrews. It is characterized as highly rhetorical. No? This is a type no? Uh, this is a type of uh, writing or speaking employed to have persuasive effect. By this, we mean that it employed many literary devices that were associated with persuasive orat oratory or urgent debate in the first century. So, most likely, you know, the, the person, the author is, uh, is good in oratory. We have a lot of that in the Church of Christ. They have to speak with persuasive oratory, like Brother Sinsel. Talagang ano, talagang pagmagpit sa uh, oratory style. But it is actually, uh, it is in a persuasive. What are some of the type of uh, 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 rhetorical style? One of them is we called synthesis in Greek. Synthesis. Synchrisis is a detailed comparison between two or more things designed to convince the audience to affirm the speaker's point of view. And so it is a, a, a detailed comparison. No? So makikita mo yun sa in Pagara, for example, in Hebrews chapter 17, chapter 7, verse 11 to 20, the authors of the book of Hebrews give this audience a compelling eight point comparison between the Melchizedek and Christ. So, kinumpara niya dito, no? Uh, this is a type of uh, rhetor rhetor rhetorical style. And we call that centrisis, where the author gave eight points of comparison between uh, Melchizedek and Christ. Uh, their parents did, the genealogy, 
the birth, the death, the office, the action, the status and achievement. That is how he uh, give us a compelling reason to accept Jesus Christ as uh, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So this is how the the uh, the so-called uh, synchronous type of rhetorical style of sermon or teaching or writing. Another device that the authors use is we call that uh, exemplar. Exemplar are less of illustration or example that follows one after the other to build a persuasive argument for a particular view. And a good example that is Hebrews chapter 11. He listed uh, uh, a familiar list of faithful in the book of Hebrews. He listed Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Rehab, G. Gideon, Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, uh, Jif, uh, David, Samuel, another prophet. The longest, the long list was designed to persuade this audience that the servant of God should remain faithful throughout their persecution. So he gave them example, a lot of example that these people, he will even they were persecuted. For example, the life of Joseph, they know it that he uh, experienced a lot of persecution. He was sold to slavery. He was in prison of wrong accusation. But God has a purpose in his life. And that is how he built his exhortation to them, making example, to persuade them to remain faithful in Christ. And the third uh, rhetorical style is known as the call uh, Wahomer. It is an Hebrew expression which is well known during the time and the rabbi, the rabbi, rabbinical tradition that may be translated the light to him. I could not remember that in English. We have that kind of uh, argument from less to greater. Is that a synopsis? I, I could not remember. Or simple, simple to complex. In our argument, you know. So he built up from small to greater, to simple, to complex. Uh, so uh, this type of argument is for example, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 to 29, Anyone who rejects the law of Moses died with mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Then he said, how much more severe do you think? A man deserved to be punished who has drowned the Son of God underfoot. 
So here the authors begin with the premise that the audience understood the punishment of those who rejected the law of Moses was there. Then he pressed his own audience further by arguing, how much more? How much more punishment should come to those who come underfoot? One that is greater than Moses. You see, before the Hebrews chapter 10, he gave them a sermon that the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. So the person who will not uh, abide the law of Moses will die. But the person who is greater than Moses, how much more you will receive a punishment to a person that is greater than Moses. That is the argument of uh, Cole Wahomer. From simple to complicated terms, from the argument of there was English and I could not remember. No. Uh, so these are the the example. Uh, uh, we will learn that as we go on in the book of uh, Hebrews. So what is the goal of the exhortation? So the authors of the book of Hebrews wrote to exhort his audience to reject Jewish teaching and to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. To reject the Jewish teaching, he said, for example, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good for our heart to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial food, which are of no value to those who eat them. Ano itong sinasabi niya? Mga katuruan, mga strange teaching. Ito yung mga teaching, alimbawa, mga ceremonial food. So we noted that uh, that the goal is uh, to reject. So they are trying to go back to that ceremonial practices in the Old Testament. But now the authors of the book, oh, he exhort them, give them. Uh, uh, a lot of exhortation or um, encouraging words not to go back to that previous religion that we have. For example, ceremonial food. They said it has no value on them. You see, uh, the Hebrews are suffering from persecutions and that this persecution tempted them to go back to uh, Jewish religion, which will lead them to apostasy. We know that in the first century, the Jews already uh, being a members of the community of the Jews, they are already received a lot of persecution. They will pay special taxes. 
for example, and from time to time, they have persecution. So uh, often the Jewish community is in the Roman Empire uh, were free to observe their, their faith, although they have sometimes persecution, for example, paying a lot of taxes. So early on, the same true with Christians. Because they were closely identified with Judaism, uh, they enjoy such thing like the Jews. But time passed, the Christian identity identification as a Jewish sect began to disappear. So yung identity ng Kristiyano ay lumilinaw no? habang uh, nakikita ng mga Jew iba ito no? remember sometimes they are, uh, they are worshiping in the synagogue so in fact the book of Acts report the event in the days of Paul that the Jewish synagogue rejected followers of Christ and encourage the local authority to, mis to mistreat them. So here is now they're facing persecution not only from the government, but the Jewish religion itself. The authors of the book did not address some sort of issue. But his emphasis dealt with the erroneous belief and practice. He did not discuss how these people mistreated them. But they showed them that their practice and belief are wrong in the sight of God. Look at uh, okay. So uh, look, I, I didn't see. Uh, I let me see if I put it. Well, I don't go. So uh, chapter Hebrews chapter thirteen verse nine. The authors of the book do not get away from all kinds of sin. Oh, I see that. I remember. That. Do not get away by all kinds of strength uh, teaching. It is good for our heart to be strengthened by grace, but not by ceremonial food, which are no value to those who eat them. So in this verse, the author contrasted between strengthened by faith, by grace rather, with being strengthened by the ceremonial food. So this is the specific focus sound familiar enough to them, but notice this was just an example what we call all kind um, strength uh, the teaching. In other words, the unusual teaching taught by Lord by the local authorities or local Jewish community. Uh, say he called it strength uh, teaching that the origin was tempted to follow. To unusual teaching, for example, the ceremonial food. You see, in the second half of the century, a number of helpful insight was actually discovered because of the Dead Sea School. And we have a lot of uh, ceremonial things that the Jews are doing or practicing, which is no longer actually according to 
Moses suno. Naging tradisyon na, no? marami na siyang dinagdag sa tradisyon ng mga Hudyo. No longer part of Moses' teaching. And that is how the this is scroll telling us these are the ceremonial food, the basic teaching is no longer the teachings of Moses, the the worshiping of, of angel is one of those found in the book of uh, I mean in the Quran that of course this is also why uh, the authors of the book in Hebrews uh, who exhorting them by telling them the superiority of Jesus Christ compared to the angels uh, because of the practices of the Jewish tradition at the time, they are now worshiping angels. That's why the authors of the book is telling them the superiority of Jesus Christ compared to the angel. Then also, uh, in the Quran, we know that uh, uh, the, Bella. the book of Hebrews discussing the book of Mithisibu because of the tradition now of the Jewish uh, Jews, which is no longer no, uh, no longer practicing. Iba iba na yung one, ang mga uh, pare, uh, high priest nila, hindi na according to the uh, teachings of Moses. The high priest in the Old Testament should be in line with the family of uh, uh, who, who is the uh, high priest in the Old Testament? The brother Aaron, Aaronic high priest. But hindi na, no? Political na, no? Naging, uh, some of them are political appointed being a high priest of uh, the Old Testament or uh, on the temple. No longer according to the teachings of Moses. So the goal of Hebrew interpretation is not only to urge the audience to reject the Jewish teaching, but also to remain them faithful to Jesus Christ. So to accomplish the goal of calling his audience to faithful service to Jesus, the author of the book, organize his, or, his, uh, his uh, uh, exhortation into five major divisions. Ito yan, no? Uh, chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 18, the authors of the Hebrews call this audience to affirm the supremacy of Christ over angelic revelation. The second section is uh, above Moses' authority. Uh, first, no? Hmm. Number three, uh, dealing with angels and Moses, then it turned to Melchizedek priesthood. Number four, he explained the supremacy of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. And fifth, major division, chapter 12, verse 1 to chapter 13, the book to give us elaborate and numbers of ways the audience needed to exercise practical perseverance. These are exhortation that uh, give them the courage to remain faithful in Christ Jesus. And so that is how uh, the exhortation uh, play a part in the book of Hebrews. 
And so we have that, but the positive, the purpose of the book, we have the positive, the word of exhortation, now the negative. So the negative is that he give them warning. There are five warnings that we can see in the book of Hebrews. They exhort them, then they give them warning. Uh, chapter 2, after give them that Jesus Christ is superior to the angel, he said, beware of neglecting salvation in chapter 2. Then, beware of not entering into rest. Chapter 3 to chapter 4, verse 13. Beware of not going Going on, going on to maturity, chapter 5, 11 to 6 to 20. Beware of insulting the spirit of grace, chapter 10, verses 26 to 31. Beware of indifference, chapter 12, 18 to 29. So all of this we will discuss as we go on. So I just mentioned it because we will discuss that as we we study the book of Revelation, the book of Hebrews. Okay. Number three purpose of the book is to instruct his readers among the superiority of Jesus Christ. And your superiority he is superior than the angel. Then the warning. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Uh, he is superior to uh, superior than Moses. The warning Take care lest any should falling away from the living God. He provide a better rest. The warning is fear lest he should come short of his rest. Number chapter four, verse one to four. He is superior high priest. A warning down. Those who have fallen away find it impossible to renew again to repentance. And the superior being a minister in a superior sanctuary. So the worship is superior. Then Jesus is so superior because. He has obtained a superior covenant or a better covenant which has been enacted on better or superior promises. So the warning, those who have fallen away find it impossible to renew again to repentance. So Jesus Christ is superior sacrifice compared to the animals' uh, sacrifices. So why don't you go back to in, uh, uh, the question to them is, why are you going back to the old uh, sacrificing, sacrificial system? Where in fact, the sacrifice of Jesus is much superior to that, the animal sacrifices. So the warning, if we go on sinning, Willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remain a sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice in the Old Testament, in the temple, is inferior. It could not take a sin. Why you go back there? So the warning is, you know it. And if you know it and continue to go back then, 
there is no longer remain a sacrifice for sin for them. So there is an exhortation and there is a one. And the reason for that, of instructing them the superiority of Jesus Christ so that they will remain faithful, uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are all aspects of basic warning. It's warning against not uh, abandoning Jesus Christ. They might have a, a spiritual uh, uh, apostasy and they could no longer return. Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ no longer available for them. If they will abandon the Lord Jesus Christ, they should remain. But at the same time, they should reject the teaching of the Jewish religion. Lagi natin yung Kaya sa, kahit na sa aklat ng pollution, no? as we discussed in my angel radio, we need to put on, or uh, we need to undress things that you uh, uh, you clothed before. You have to put out and then put in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, being the citizens of heaven. You don't need to know. In order to be faithful in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to reject something. Something in the past that you're no longer practicing it. Now, because Christ is superior. So that is how the message of the book of Hebrews Christ is superior. He is better than what you left before. Even to us, Filipinos, we have, in my part, I left cathedrals. Uh, we left a lot of, you know, uh, established religion. But still, although it's a small chapter, it is greater than in our old religion. And that is how the book of uh, Hebrews will encourage us to, be rem to remain faithful. Okay, so next time we will study when God spoke in the best way. No, that is chapter one. No. Okay, so.